today I'm going to talk mostly about my experiences studying them, what behavioral ecology research looks like, which is the research I was doing, a little bit about prairie dog ecology, so the relationship with their environment, and then lastly, I want to share with you guys um, a bit of philosophy, actually, um, what the prairie dogs taught me and what I learned from studying them and just spending time with them. So I've, as Siobhan mentioned, I've worked with several um, animals and on several projects. Just a little bit of background on me, even though I'm about 10% as interesting as a single prairie dog, but I did my undergraduate research on red squirrels up in Maine, and I studied their behavior, um, including kleptoparasitism, which is when red squirrels steal cones from each other. And that's where I fell in love with rodent behavior, especially the squirrels. Prairie dogs are in the squirrel family. They're a type of ground squirrel, so I'm still working with squirrels technically. I also worked with bears. Um, in, that, in that research, it was more studying their movements across the landscape. And of course, the prairie dogs are what I am talking about today. Before I can really say much about prairie dogs, I wanted to talk just a bit about my mentor, Dr. John Hoagland. He is the leading expert on prairie dog behavior. He has been studying prairie dogs since 1974. So he spent over 45 years in the field with prairie dogs, half of every year out there. Um, I estimated probably about 60,000 hours he has spent in the field living with and studying prairie dogs. He did study four of the five species um, of prairie dogs, and I'll talk a bit more about the species um, in a bit. Unfortunately, John retired from the field in 2019, so I really am missing seeing him, but he's currently working on his magnum opus book on prairie dogs, um, so I'm really looking forward to when that comes out. It'll be really good. I'm gonna take you guys through some parts. Um, the first is part one, research, just to talk to you about exactly what I was doing out there for three years. So in order to study prairie dogs, you need to know them and you need to trap them and mark them, basically. So you can't study behavior of a prairie dog if you don't know who you're looking at. If you have a prairie dog and you see them um, doing a behavior, if you don't know who it is, then it's not really a data point you can take. So first we have to set traps to catch the prairie dogs. There are a couple of different things we do. Um, they're in the long sleeve blue shirt, that's John, um, with some field assistance, I'm behind the camera. <laughs> but uh, we will set a spread of traps and we'll bait them and hope that prairie dogs will hop in. We also, on the bottom left, you can see what we call a surround. And we surround a prairie dog's burrow entry with these traps and we only do this if catching the dog is really time sensitive. If we absolutely must catch the dog that day for any reason, we will surround their trap, or I'm sorry, their burrow, and we plug any exit burrows. And I'm gonna call them dogs a lot. Obviously I'm talking prairie dogs, but I just, we call them dogs out there. And handling is of course, when we collect their biological data and we mark them. And this is what marking looks like up on the upper left. Every dog receives an ear tag, actually two ear tags with unique numbers on them so that we know who they are. And they also receive a unique marking. And we use hair dye. It's the same hair dye that humans use. It's, it's the same, same chemical makeup, but that also means that it disappears after each molt. And the dogs will molt twice while we're out there during our research season. So we actually do a lot of trapping so that we can continue to make sure that they're marked and we can identify them uh, with our binoculars. So this one's marked 41. That's a male. Males are marked zero through 49. Females are marked 50 and beyond. And females also receive special markings like stripes. Down at the bottom, we have a photo of an ultrasound. We also perform ultrasounds on pregnant females and we do this to count their fetuses. John uses this data to compare to the amount of juveniles that pop out of the, their nursery burrow in June. And ca um, comparing those numbers can tell us a little bit about a mother's behavior actually. And it can tell us about how successful a mother is in weaning her offspring. We also take tissue samples right before we ear tag a prairie dog or after. And we use those tissue samples for genetics as well. Now that we've 
caught and collected all the information on a dog and marked it, we can collect our behavioral data. Up on the upper left, that's a handling sheet. That's what we collect while we're marking them. I circled a bit of poop there for you guys. <laughs> that is a poop stain. Uh, the prairie dogs get very poopy on us. Um, so there's a lot, there's a lot of bodily fluids. Um, it's just the nature of working with rodents. Um, and I've worked with other rodents before. Uh, on the handling sheet, we collect all the biological data we need. We also collect the number of fleas that are on a prairie dog. And that's important if the prairie dog eventually um, comes up with plague, which I will talk about in a bit as well. On the bottom left is our daily census. Every day we were filling out this data sheet. So we would arrive on site before any of the prairie dogs woke up. So while they were still underground, they sleep in their burrows. So we would arrive on site before they woke up and we would record the time and location where the dog was waking up. So every burrow had an address. So like CX at the top is an address. Um, and then of course we would need to record their beds. So we wouldn't leave for the day until the last dog had gone underground and they don't go underground until it's almost dark, um, until well into dusk. So the days can be pretty long, depending on the time of the year, of course, and the sun, the days can be anywhere between 12 and 14 hours. And most of it you're spending in your observation tower, which I'll show you guys in a bit. And on the right is our behavioral data sheet. The crux of behavioral um, data is observation. So for our research, we take observations of interactions between individual prairie dogs. Usually it's between two prairie dogs. And I highlighted a line here um, to, to kind of interpret this data for you. So you'll see I wrote a timestamp. This was a one minute interaction. Site N, that means it occurred at burrow N. That's just the address for the burrow. That way we know exactly the location of where this happened. The two individuals involved were 45 and 29. These are two males and they engaged in a territorial dispute and we code that TD. A territorial dispute is what it sounds like. It's an argument between two prairie dogs over territory and space. And I'll be telling you a little bit more that, uh, about that in a bit. But you can see other codes on here. C, for example, you see a lot of, C, of, of the letter C. Um, that means chase. There is a lot of chasing going on between prairie dogs, especially earlier in the season. A lot of herding, which is H and running away and kissing. It's a lot of data. And if you look at the timestamps, you can see how quickly I have to write these data points down. Some days I might fill out six or seven of these sheets. Other days when it's really slow, I would only fill out half a sheet or one sheet. I really wanted to show this short clip of an ultrasound. This is gonna be a video. There's no sound and it's only 10 seconds long, but I added a, a white oval there so you can look in that spot specifically because a prairie dog is going to pop into this. Um, it's gonna be a prairie dog's head, obviously a fetus, and this is an ultrasound of a pregnant mother. And there it is. Um, I, I just paused it right there on the screen. It's an overhead view. You can see the nose is pointing up on the screen and that's a prairie dog's head. And as we go, as we're doing the ultrasound, we have to count exactly how many babies we see. It's quite dif difficult, it takes some training. So how do we, or where do we take this data rather? This observation tower on the left is where I spent most of my time in 2016. This was the first year I studied prairie dogs. At the window, at window height, it's about four meters, so about 13 feet. And I had a full view of the area around me. This tower sat right on top of a colony so there were burrows all around the tower and I was responsible for about 30 dogs, which is three clans. So colonies and subcolonies are divided into clans and each clan has a specific territory, a specific space that they, that they dominate. It consists of one dominant male and several adult females. All the females are kin, so they're all blood related. Female prairie dogs are what we call philopatric and they, they're loyal to one spot basically. So where a female prairie dog is born, she spends the, the entirety of her life. And so she lives in this territory with her sisters, mothers, daughters, uh, female cousins, aunts, nieces. They're all blood related and they're all for the most part friendly with each other. The dominant male is not blood related. 
he comes in, there's a new dominant male occasionally who comes in to um, control the territory. The clan also consists of a few yearling males. So those are one-year-old males. Male Gunnison's prairie dogs are not sexually mature yet. They don't become sexually mature until they're two years old. On the other hand, females become sexually mature at one year old. So there's a bit of a difference there, but the yearling males just kind of hang out and mind their own business as much as they can until they're two years old and they disperse. And of course, in the summer when the juveniles, which is what we call the babies, when they pop up out of their burrows, the population really explodes. So I was responsible for many more dogs than 30. On the right is a view of the inside of my observation tower. And the most important of my tools included a walkie-talkie, which you can see in the lower left on this bucket, I used as a side table, as well as the data sheet, of course. The most important thing, a pen that I had to rope to the data sheet because I was constantly losing it. My binocular, if you don't have a binocular, it's really difficult to do behavioral work with prairie dogs because of the way they run around. And we use the dye markings that you saw before to identify them really quickly um, with our binocular. And the windows were great in this particular tower. I felt a little bit guilty because the other field assistants, and there were five of us in separate towers, which were several meters from each other, which is why we needed the walkie talkie. The other field assistants didn't have windows that opened and closed, but I got lucky <laughs> and I had a tower with windows that opened and closed. So when there was a rainstorm or a snowstorm, <laughs> my poor field mates had to just throw a blanket over themselves or something. And I'm just over here closing my windows. <laughs> and I felt a little bad, but I, I consider myself really lucky. That was my tower. I actually fell out of this tower once. Um, I didn't fall out of the window, there's a trap door on the bottom of the tower. I had to go up the ladder on the side that you see there. And there's a trap door to come get in and out. And um, I was on my way out of the tower once and I fell out and I can't even say how I fell out. Somehow my, I lost my grip, but it was a bit of a long fall. Um, but that's really the only injury I sustained, I sustained doing prairie dog work. So what are prairie dogs? I'd like to talk to you guys a bit about their ecology. Prairie dogs are semi-fossorial or fossorial, um, depending on how you define it, but it means that they live underground or are designed to live underground. Prairie dogs sleep underground. They copulate underground, which, so they mate underground. They take care of their babies underground. And of course they hide underground when there are predators or threats, but they spend the rest of their day above ground. They're above ground most of the day. They hardly are in their burrows unless they're sleeping. Their eyes are really high in their head. That way when they come out of their burrow, they can see as quickly as possible. They can see as well as possible without having to emerge completely, just in case there are threats. They have fat noses, fat little cute little noses, and they use that the extra tissue on their nose um, to pat dirt and to move dirt around in their burrows and in their tunnels. They have small ears. Prairie dogs actually have large inner ears and they can hear really well, but their outer ears are small and that's just to keep dirt from entering um, as they're moving around below ground. They're shaped long and tubular with short legs. This makes it very easy to move through tunnels and it means they don't have to make their tunnels very, too large. And of course their sharp claws help to move dirt around and they're also used for tilling and for pulling grasses. So there are five species of prairie dog and they're all endemic to North America. The most common one and the most numerous is the black-tailed prairie dog. Um, the other species are the white-tailed, the Utah, the Gunnison's, and the Mexican. You'll see in red is the, the range of the Gunnison's, that's the prairie dog up here in this region. It occurs in the four corners of New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, and Colorado. So there are two species of prairie dog in New Mexico, but the black-tailed is found farther south. The Mexican prairie dog is the least studied. You can see it's very, it has a very small range. It's also the least numerous, and it occurs only in a small patch in north central Mexico. As far as protections, the Utah prairie dog and the Mexican are the only species protected on the, the Endangered Species Act. So the Mexican 
does, uh, they, we do afford protection to the Mexican prairie dog. They're considered, or rather they're listed as endangered. The Utah is listed as threatened, so it doesn't quite get as many protections. Its habitat doesn't quite get as many protections either. Prairie dogs are a keystone species. They, among many, many benefits that they provide for grasslands, they keep native, native vegetation healthy. They're tilling the soil, which also mixes the chemicals in the soil. They also prevent exotic species, exotic vegetation species from taking hold. And they create a, an ecosystem that doesn't really allow exotic species to dominate. And of course, they also provide ha habitat for numerous vertebrates and invertebrates, whether it's inside their burrow or around their burrow. The, their biggest role in grassland, of course, is to provide calories for predators. Prairie dogs are very ca calorie den dense, calorie dense, and um, it's a really great catch for a predator to be able to feed on a prairie dog. Now they're very famous for their vocalizations, um, especially their territorial call and their alarm call. And I'm gonna show you guys a couple of videos. This first one shows a territorial call. Hopefully the sound will work. So I hope you heard that. It's like a chattering sound. This guy's got a piece of grass stuck on his head. <laughs> prairie dogs make this sound, um, just as the name would imply, to establish territorial boundaries. a two-year-old male. He's basically telling everybody, hey, this is my space. I was just in my burrow, but hey, I'm out now. I hope nobody's trying to invade my space. It belongs to me. It's only mine. And often other prairie dogs will respond, any prairie dogs around them. So the territorial, actually the territorial call is also used as a sort of roll call. And this only occurs in the morning and the evening. So when everybody wakes up, they start territorial calling and then everybody else responds. So everybody can kind of get an idea of where their neighbors are. And they do the same thing right before they go down to bed at night so that everybody can kind of get, a, get an idea of who's still awake. Usually the dominant male will refuse to go underground if others are still awake and we'll, we'll just be waiting in our towers for, and it'll get dark even until finally the, the dominant male will finally decide, all right, I'm the last one up, got the last uh, word in and then go to sleep. And of course the prairie dog is so named for its barking vocalization, what you might call a bark. We call it the alarm call. It's an anti-predator call and they only emit this call when there's a threat nearby. Very loud. So they emit this call when it's definite that a predator is either approaching or already inside their territory. They will very often run to their burrow while they're calling just in case, but they don't usually go underground unless the approach is definitely imminent and they're very scared that they may get caught. They don't like to go underground because they can't see what's happening above ground. So they'll just bark from above ground. So if you go up to the VCMP and you hear this sound, it means the prairie dogs are spooked by something. They will bark at people, but but usually they'll, they'll bark more commonly um, at terrestrial predators, so coyotes and badgers. Um, they do not emit this sound for birds. Birds usually swoop in so quickly that the prairie dogs don't actually have time to let out much alarm calling. They will make one bark. Usually they have time for one bark before they've, they've run into their burrows. Um, they respond to avian predators much more differently than um, terrestrial predators. This is a picture of a Swainson's hawk. So I'm going to show you some photos of some common predators. Um, raptors, 
up in the VCMP include Swainson talks, more commonly uh, Cooper talks, um, Shrepshin, I believe, and Golden Eagles as well. Snakes will also feed on baby prairie dogs. It's most commonly bull snakes, but occasionally there will be rattlesnakes, which is what this is a photo of. Badgers are voracious predators of prairie dogs. In 2018, we lost 45 prairie dogs to a single badger. She, she was a mama, so she had a lot of babies to feed and she took a lot of our prairie dogs. She hunted during the day and the night. Coyotes are the most common predator up in the VCMP of prairie dogs. They will sit at a prairie dog's burrow and just wait for a prairie dog to pop up. And if they're quiet enough, the prairie dog will have no idea they're there. Weasels are less common, but they also like to feed on prairie dog babies. And I don't have a picture of one, but bobcats are also a common predator. This is a very brief video of a badger. You'll see the badger coming in. He's on the left as I press play. You'll see him a little bit centered. A prairie dog is about to run up, not knowing the badger is there. There he is. That was a bit of a half-hearted, slow to the taste lunge. Usually badgers are faster than that. You can see how well this badger camouflages with the grass and how well it blends in. They stay very flat and low to the ground, so it's difficult to see them until you're too close. Luckily, that one prairie dog got away. This was the female badger who killed 45 of our dogs. So in order to protect themselves from predators, prairie dogs evolved to live in colonies. Life in a colony is safe. safe. You have safety in numbers. You can see all these prairie dogs in this photo. They're standing on alert and they're all watching for predators. There is a predator nearby, in fact, in this photo, and they're all keeping an eye on the predator. Um, there'll be alarm calls. And you can see how safe it is, especially to be in the middle of the colony. Um, you're pretty well protected. It's difficult for a, a predator to grab a prairie dog, unless like a badger, they're living in among the prairie dogs. So there is a lot of safety, but there are also disadvantages to living in a colony. It's very difficult to compete over resources when you're living in such close quarters. So you're competing for space, for sustenance, food and water. Prairie dogs don't need a water source. They get most of their moisture from their food, but if there is a water source, um, they will compete for it. And they also compete for mates. So it's a difficult life. There's actually a lot of tension and conflict in a prairie dog colony, despite the premise of cooperation that living in a, a colony requires. Despite the tension and uh, conflict, they all protect each other no matter what. So if there's a predator, they will call. Usually, actually, females call more often, but they all call. So to give you a little bit more context around these behaviors, I want to take you through a year in the life of a Gunnison's prairie dog. And we're going to start in March and April. Up here at these high elevations, Gunnison's prairie dogs will hibernate over through the winter. Some species, like the black-tailed prairie dog, they don't hibernate. They're found at lower elevations. But Gunnison's prairie dogs do hibernate, so they're down underground all winter. They emerge in March. The males will come out first, and because they've been sleeping all winter, they need to reestablish their territories. And then the females emerge and the mating season begins. It's a very frenetic time. There is a lot of chasing and running around. Here's a prairie dog in the snow. It's, there's always some snow left um, by March. There's always still snow in March, even sometimes into April up in the VCMP. This is a male. He's marked zero. He was one of our most audacious dominant males in 2017 and 2018. Here's a male letting out a territorial call. You can see he's all muddy and wet. Prairie dogs do not like to be wet. It affects their thermal regulation, so their ability to control their body temperature. But during the mating season, they will get wet. They'll be out in the snow. They'll do anything to make sure they have access to females. There's a lot of running around to reestablish bo the boundaries of your territory. There'll be a lot of usurping dominant males, a lot of moving around. This is a territorial dispute, which I mentioned earlier. These two males are locked in a hostile kiss. So this kind of hostile kiss involves them locking their jaws together or opening their mouths against each other and facing off. It's basically a way they face off. They're exchanging some sort of information. 
Um, maybe they're making a noise we can't hear, um, but there's definitely some sort of either taste or smell. Um, and they're, they're facing off and the loser of the face off will jump away and run off and be chased by the victor. Most territorial disputes end this way. They end with a chase. Occasionally, a territorial dispute will end in a contact fight. They last two to three seconds. They're very quick. The two dogs will roll in a ball. They'll, they'll kick, they'll, they'll claw, they'll bite each, other, uh, bite each other. Sometimes some serious injuries can occur. Uh, I knew two dogs who actually died after full contact fights over breeding females and a third dog who was terribly maimed and actually disappeared after a couple of weeks. So I think he died as well. Here's another photo of a fight. It happens very quickly. This is more common is the chase resulting uh, from a territorial dispute. Another chase between two males. This male was very badly injured during a fight. He's a dominant male. He won that fight, but he, he did not leave the fight unscathed. Meanwhile, the females during the mating season are watching and waiting. A female prairie dog only goes into estrus one day of the year, which means she's sexually receptive one day of the year. So when she goes into estrus, all the dogs around her kind of go a bit crazy. The dominant male of her clan will usually be the first to mate with her. But then um, prairie dogs, Gunnison's prairie dogs are what we call polyandra. So the females will mate with multiple males. And so this female, after she mates with her dominant male, will attempt to escape and seek out other males farther from her territory. So the dominant male has to make sure this doesn't happen. He has to keep an eye on the female on her day of estrus. Remember, she only has one day, so it's very time sensitive, but he has to keep an eye on her. And anytime she tries to escape, he will herd her back to her burrow, sometimes violently, but very aggressively. So while he's trying to do that, of course, from, uh, from adjacent colon of uh, territories, other males are trying to get in so that they, they can access the female. So you can imagine that males run themselves ragged during this time. The dominant male is trying to keep his female where he wants her. He's trying to keep the other males from coming in. Almost always, inevitably, the female will get away because the dominant male is busy fighting off another male. Almost every female prairie dog, every season, Gunnison's prairie dog will end up mating with multiple males. They always get away. This is what a copulation looks like. Gunnison's prairie dogs actually rarely copulate above ground. There are many behavioral differences among the species. White-tailed prairie dogs, for example, commonly uh, copulate above ground. Gunnison's do not. Every year there were one or two copulations above ground that I witnessed, but it was very rare. They prefer to go underground where other prairie dogs can't pester them and where they're not as vulnerable. This is what <laughs> a male looks like um, halfway or toward the end of a breeding season. This guy's got scabs all over himself and scars. Um, they look pretty beat up by the end of a, of a mating season. They're also molting during this time and the stress actually makes the males molt faster. And of course in fights, they're clawing at each other and so the hair comes out faster as well. So I have a quick video here of a territorial dispute. This is zero. This was actually taken um, at the visitor center in the Valle Grande. This is where our research site was for two years. Most territorial disputes end in a chase, which is what happens with this one. You're gonna see the challenging male coming up and they're going in for a hostile kiss. challenging each other. And that one ended in a chase. And it looked really cute, but that was a hostile interaction. I love the way they bounce around in the snow. Zero won that fight. So we've gone through March and April, and we're, we've gone through the mating season, and we're entering into May. At this time, the males are recovering from their battles. They're just trying to heal their scars and trying to put on weight. Pregnant females are nesting during this time. So they're bringing nesting material into nursery burrows and nesting material is just grass. They collect grass and bring it into their nursery burrows as they prepare for their babies to be born. 
mothers actually become quite aggressive during this time. If you'll recall, I mentioned that mothers in a clan are related to each other. So they're sisters and mothers and daughters, they're all blood related. And all year round, they're mostly friendly and peaceful with each other. Uh, the interactions don't tend to be aggressive. But during this time, when they're pregnant and after the juveniles are born underground, they become very territorial. They don't want any uh, anybody else near their babies. So they become very aggressive even to their sisters and mothers. Here's a photo of a female gathering nesting material. They're actually pretty cute when they do this. They just stuff their mouths with as much grass as they can. This is a female chasing off another female who got too close to her nursery burrow. This is a full contact fight between two females. Very rare to see a full contact fight between two females. It occurs sometimes when they're pregnant. They're just as vicious and violent as full contact fights between males and some serious injuries can occur. But usually during May, the dogs are just chilling, just hanging out in the grass. The grass is getting longer, they're out foraging, and they generally just look peaceful. They're being vigilant, but pretty calm. So then we enter into June and July. This is the time when the juveniles are emerging from their nursery burrows. After they're born in May, they remain in their nursery burrows for about five and a half weeks. And then a little bit into July, they start to come out. They're mostly weaned by then, so they're off their mother's milk and eating grass, um, but they're still suckling a bit as well. The mother's mostly relaxed by this time. They stop being aggressive. There are a few, a couple holdouts here and there, mothers who are especially territorial, but for the most part, they relax and are suddenly friendly with each other again because their babies are big enough to protect themselves. This is my favorite time of the year because babies are adorable. So even as a scientist, I can say that uh, baby animals are just really cute. They're very fun to watch. They come out extremely small. Um, some of them are so tiny. This uh, baby prairie dog is marked. So we've already caught her and marked her. When the babies come out, we want to catch them as soon as possible before they want, start wandering from their burrow because we want to establish who, what mother they belong to. We want to make sure we keep those family identities because it informs a lot about the, not only behavior, but also some ecology for the prairie dogs as well. This is a female baby, and I know that because her head is marked. So for the juveniles, the females also get a black cap. We don't put a black cap on the males. And we, want to, we just do that so that we can tell the difference between sisters and brothers. This is a photo of two brothers from the same litter actually, and they're playing and they look really silly and clumsy. So it, it's a lot of fun to watch them play. Um, early in the season, they don't really know what they're doing and they just kind of play fight. This is a video of a kiss. Um, remember the hostile kiss you saw earlier? Kisses can also be friendly, and we call this a friendly kiss. They look identical, except of course for context. This is a mother kissing her baby. She's saying hello. Um, prairie dogs use friendly kisses to say hello and to identify each other. Here's a mother allowing her babies to suckle above ground. And this is notable because Gunnison's prairie dogs rarely uh, allow their babies to suckle above ground. It always happens underground. So we were, I was lucky to catch this. Now they are mostly weaned, as I mentioned before, but they're still suckling if they can get away with it. This is the same mother with one of her daughters. This is the same mother with one of her sons. Sometimes mothers will transfer their babies from one nursery burrow to a new nursery burrow, whether because they don't like their neighbors or there was a threat nearby for various reasons. When the prairie dogs are this big, um, when the babies are this big, the mother will usually just lead them and the baby will follow in a line after her mother like a duckling. And um, that's how they transfer them when they're this big. On this particular day, this baby just didn't seem to get the point. Like, he didn't seem to get the message. She kept attempting to lead him. He, she'd gotten all her brothers and sisters, but this guy just wasn't getting it. And he kept running around and losing his way. So finally she got frustrated and just picked him up and carried him. Uh, and I'm sure he was very heavy, but um, she'd had enough. 
here's a baby being released from a trap. Um, whenever we release any prairie dog, we return them to exactly the same spot we caught them. It's especially important for babies because we don't want them to get lost. If we release any prairie dog in an area where they don't live, they might receive um, aggression from the prairie dogs that do live there. So we don't want to make that kind of mistake. And that's just a close up of a cute little baby. Sometimes they come out very, very small. The more babies a mother has in her litter, the smaller they are. So this is a video of a play bout. Um, there's not really much sound on this one. This is a brother and sister playing. They don't really know what they're doing. <laughs> it's very clumsy. Play is important for juveniles. It, uh, it helps them to build physical and social competence so that when they grow up and they have to navigate the physical and social labyrinth of, of prairie dog life, the more they play as juveniles, the better they are at it as adults. So play is cute and fun to watch, but it's, it also plays an important ecological role for individual prairie dogs. That was actually a long play bout. Most play bouts only last five to 10 seconds. Um, since these two didn't seem to know what they were doing, they just kept on going and falling around. And this is a video of a friendly kiss. This mother, is coming in to find her babies because they wandered around. The unmarked babies are hers. There's a marked baby in the corner that is not her baby. This is play behavior. Usually the mothers won't tolerate play behavior, but 50 here uh, was very young. She was a yearling mother, a first time mother, and she did sometimes play with her babies to a point she would tolerate it. In a moment, she's going to go up and kiss the marked baby who's not hers, and you'll see how quickly she pulls away. She wants nothing to do with that baby. So all those friendly kisses were her just saying, hello, yes, you're my baby, you're my baby, yeah, you can play with me, see you later. So we've gone through June and July, um, the most enjoyable time for a researcher because we get to watch the baby prairie dogs. In July, we actually leave the field um, for the purposes of behavioral ecology research. Once we have all the babies marked, we leave the field in July. The prairie dogs enter into August and October. Everyone's continuing to gain weight. This is a time when yearling one-year-old males disperse. Um, they want to disperse before they become sexually active or sexually mature, which will happen in the next year. They don't want to inbreed with um, their female relatives. So they evolved the instinct to disperse during this time. Sometimes they'll disperse next spring, and but most often they'll disperse during this time. And in mid to late October, they begin submerging for hibernation. They don't all drop at once. Some of them drop really early and some of them drop really late. I call this the beauty rest period. Um, there's a lot of calm in the colony. There's not much going on, which is also part of the reason we're not taking data at this point because there's, there's not much interaction going on. This is a time for the males to really get healthy again and for their scars to heal. This is a male who's almost fully healed. He actually looks a little bit like a female here. Really nice, clean fur. As a comparison, this is a female. Unless they've had a, it particularly rough, females are pretty all year round. Um, I think this is a really beautiful prairie dog. John would see this prairie dog and call her ugly because she isn't marked and she isn't ear tagged. Um, and so any prairie dog that wasn't marked or ear, tag, ear tagged was ugly to John. And um, he thought so because you can't collect data on an unmarked dog. Anything that unmarked dog is doing is not significant as far as data because you can't take behavioral data if you don't know who you're looking at. So he called these dogs ugly, but I think this female is particularly beautiful. Uh, this is a male and he's very handsome. He's nice and clean. He's got no scars. He's fat, which is a very good thing for this time of the year. It means he's probably going to have a really good winter 
when he drops for hibernation. He's actually in the middle of a territorial call here, but he didn't even bother getting up. He's just kind of slouched over, just relaxing at his burrow mound. It's a really relaxing time and he's just, just chilling. He's a really handsome prairie dog. Really, really good looking guy. Uh, the grass gets very long during this time as well, so it's actually very hard to see the prairie dogs. Uh, this one's alarm calling, something got too close. It may even have been me. <laughs> so we've gone through August and October and we enter October through March and the dogs are hibernating underground during this time. There's some, there are some anecdotal stories that prairie dogs will come up and have periods of activity, maybe for a day. Um, we haven't collected any data on that. Anecdotal stories are still important. They can inform directions that you can go to collect data. But of course, we can't really analyze anecdotal stories, but we always keep them in mind for further ideas for research. So briefly before I finish off, I wanted to talk about plague. You can't really talk about prairie dogs without mentioning plague. This picture was taken on the other side of Redondo Mountain from the Valles Caldera. This is Redondo Meadow. This is actually where we spent all of 2016. All the photos and videos you just saw were from 2017 and 2018 at our site at the Valle Grande near the Visitor Center. But in 2016, we spent the whole season, the whole year at this meadow. It's called Redondo Meadow. It's very secluded. Um, it's very quiet. You hardly see people here. Um, all you see are prairie dogs running around. All you hear are prairie dogs making noises. So it was a really great research site. Um, but of course, we left that research site, and the reason is that the colony collapsed to plague at the end of 2016. I got to know the prairie dogs here very well. It was my first experience researching prairie dogs. I really fell in love with them, and almost all of them died, and it was very sad to me. I still have memories of each one. Prairie dogs have unique personalities. Um, it got to a point where I could recognize individuals even if they weren't marked. Sometimes they even have unique voices. Um, some of my favorites, there was Soldier, who liked to crawl on his belly when he, when he approached females. Houdini, who I was always losing track of, he was a young yearling male. Scout, Hansel and Gretel, two inseparable brother and sisters. Orphan Annie, Clover. Happy Feet, who had a, a black stripe on her back, that was her marking, so when she stood up she looked like a penguin. Viejo, who was really old. Nosferatu, who, who used to stand with his arms hanging out the way the vampire Nosferatu did, if you, if you get that reference. Davy Jones, his voice was really strange. It sounded like he had water in his throat all the time. Lady Macbeth, who killed one of her nieces, and when she came out of that burrow, she had blood on her hands. Thumbelina, who's really, really small. She was a yearling female, but she looked like a baby. Goliath, who went the opposite way. He was a yearling male, but he looked like an adult. Strangely enough, Thumbelina and Goliath shared a burrow. Tweedledum and Tweedledee, who were uh, two sisters, who were constantly getting caught in traps. Even in traps we didn't set for them, they would somehow find the trap and get caught. So I called them Tweedledum and Tweedledee. And there was this dog here, Demeter. She was part of the colony in 2016. She got in a vicious fight with another mother when they were both pregnant. And during that fight, Demeter broke her finger. If you look at her right forepaw, so screen left, but her right, um, one of the fingers is kind of askew. She broke that finger during that fight. And unfortunately, she lost that fight. After that fight, she was ostracized and sent to the outside of the clan, the outside of the community. So she lived on the fringes of the colony. It's very dangerous for a prairie dog to live out there because they have less protection and it's easier for them to fall prey. She also did not interact with many prairie dogs after that. It was really sad to watch because she was one of my favorites and she wasn't getting approached by many prairie dogs. She was just very lonely and even sadder, she lost her babies that year. And we don't know if she miscarried because of the vicious fight she was in while she was pregnant or because of the stress, perhaps her babies just um, failed to thrive after they were born underground. Um, but she did not have babies that year. And it was sad because she was old. She was four years old that year. And then of course, everybody died. Um, and we came back in 2017, the year after the plague, and lo and behold, Demeter is alive. So I was very excited to find her alive. My theory 
is that she survived because she was on the fringes of the colony and she wasn't interacting with may, many other dogs. Plague is spread by fleas. So in such tight quarters, fleas can easily hop from one dog from, to another. It's a really good environment for fleas. They reproduce quickly and the plague spreads very quickly through a prairie dog colony. They can drop in a couple weeks. Mortality is almost always very close to 100% or 100%. But this old lady survived. And I was really proud of her when I saw her in 2017 and discovered that she was lactating. And I was waiting for her babies to pop up. I waited half a day that day for her babies to pop up. And lo and behold, when they popped up and there were seven of them. This is an extraordinary large litter for any female prairie dog, let alone a geriatric female prairie dog at, at five years old. The uh, average litter for um, a, a Gunnison's prairie dog is three to four babies, sometimes as few as one, sometimes as many as six, but even that's uh, extraordinary. Demeter had seven babies that year, and I was so astonished and proud of her. I believe her body knew that this was her last chance to pass on a genetic legacy and just gave it as, as much as it could. She gave as much energy as she could into um, rearing a successful litter of seven babies. So after almost everybody died in Redondo Meadow, I came back the next year to find this and I was very, very hopeful. I should tell you now this story does not have a happy ending, but there was also a second survivor. This is Pathfinder. Uh, I named her so because she ran around a lot, um, but she had also survived the plague in 2016. She was actually a baby the year the plague hit in 2016. And she lived in a borough with her brothers and sisters and her mother. So I have no idea how she survived. It's uh, very rare, but not unheard of that a prairie dog will survive the plague. If I had the equipment to collect blood from her, I would have looked for antibodies in her system. But she was a one-year-old in 2017 and she did have three babies. So I don't know who impregnated these females because Pathfinder and Demeter were the only survivors from the plague. It was, of course, it would have been a male from an adjacent colony who had also survived the plague because it hit other colonies. He must have come in, impregnated the females, and then left because he certainly didn't hang around. So I mentioned a moment ago that uh, this story does not have much of a happy ending. Um, I was very hopeful when I came in 2016 and found so many of the prairie dogs, more than I expected, which was zero. So I'm gonna run you through a quick timeline. 2016 was a plague event. We had about 150 prairie dogs that we had marked there and there were only two survivors. That was Demeter and Pathfinder. 2017, after they had their babies, there were 12 total inhabitants. And I thought, great, I'm gonna come back every year and I'm gonna watch this, this meadow grow again, uh, watch this colony grow again. Sadly, in 2018, when I came back, I only found half of the inhabitants. I only found six. Demeter was unaccounted for, which I was expecting because she was an old lady um, the year before, but I only found two of her offspring, which was actually very sad um, for me because she'd had so many. And Pathfinder, she was still there, and so were her three offspring. So they were still alive, but so many had been lost. And it made sense to me because with such a small colony, the dogs weren't actually alarm calling, they weren't letting out territorial calls. So it's very easy for a predator to swoop in and grab a dog in that kind of environment. 2019 was even sadder. We only had three inhabitants at Redondo Meadow. Uh, they were all Pathfinder's offspring. Pathfinder was unaccounted for. Um, she would not have left her babies. Um, so I believe that she was taken by a predator none of Demeter's family were found. So that amazing litter of seven prairie dogs were gone. And I believe they all fell to predation. It's possible that at this, at this age, the males who would have been two, um, it's possible that they had, they had dispersed, but I didn't even find the female. So that was really sad for me. And 2020, I have not had a chance to go up there and do my census yet. I'm waiting for my park service permit, which like many things this summer has been delayed. Uh, but the trend is not promising. Uh, the trend has been toward failure. I'd like to remain optimistic, but I'm not going to get my hopes up too high. I say all this to, to share, I guess, my grief with you all because I loved this colony so much. And to watch them drop so quickly and then fail to recover was a real blow. 
Um, a post-play colony site is very quiet. There are no sounds. There's also a drop in animal biodiversity because when you lose a prey animal, you also lose the predators. And you also lose all the other animals who use the burrows as habitat as well because the burrows eventually become filled in uh, by moving soil. There are also changes in vegetation. You can see a lot of mullein here. That's the stalks. It's an exotic species. It's been in the Southwest for a long time, but it's not a native species. And after the prairie dog dies, it just exp died. It, it exploded. It wasn't so numerous um, in 2016 when the dogs were here. So um, it does say a lot about um, how much prairie dogs encourage native vegetation and do not allow exotic species to thrive. So it was very, very odd to be there in such quiet. It's still beautiful, but not the meadow I knew not the meadow that challenged me, not the meadow where I learned about myself after 1200 hours of being in my own company. Even though there were other researchers around on very quiet days, it was like you were by yourself. It was very lonely, it was very solitary, and being out there for so many hours really kind of left you alone with your thoughts. And there were moments, there were days when my thoughts were really dark. Um, there were days when I was so lonely that, and so bored, if the prairie dogs weren't doing anything, so bored that I, I approached moments of delirium. It was very um, depressing sometimes, uh, but those moments were actually few. I had more moments of clarity in that meadow. I, be, you know, between moments of delirium, I, there was this, this great peace in that meadow. And it, it's only happened to me in that meadow. At the other side, it didn't happen. And maybe it's because it was my first year out there, but I really found my religion out there. I, I found this great peace and this great calm. And I had these meditative moments where I didn't know if time was going backward or if time was going forward. And I would just watch the clouds pass by. And if the dogs weren't doing anything, I would just sit there watching the sky. And it and many truths I feel came to me during that time. And I really got to know myself, what I was capable of, the mental stamina I was capable of. I, I love that meadow so much. It's my favorite place on earth. And it really taught me a lot about being human and about being a prairie dog, which is, you know, there are a lot of similarities between prairie dogs and people. So I'm, I'm very grateful to Redondo Meadow for that. And I hope that one day I'll return to Redondo Meadow and discover a, a bustling colony of prairie dogs again. Um, it, it would be great uh, for it to come alive again with prairie dogs. So to finish off, um, just some final words. I've been talking a bit about philosophy. Um, I did learn a lot from studying these little guys. As rodents, prairie dogs are, are just little packets of energy. And I learned from rodents what the purpose of life was. And it was just to exchange energy with your environment. That's the purpose of life. And when you're unable to exchange energy, you die. And learning that from prairie dogs actually lifted a burden from me. It lifted a lot of anxieties in my life. I was worried that I hadn't done great things. I was already in my early 30s and, and I hadn't written a book or I hadn't saved anyone. Um, but when, when prairie dogs taught me that, that my purpose here was just to exchange energy, there was this simplicity and beauty in it. I will always be grateful to prairie dogs for teaching me that. And I hope other people can spend time with prairie dogs and to see them just being these little packets of energy out in the grassland and maybe some, find some clarity in your heart as well. Uh, I believe every moment of your life is purposeful and that's what the prairie dogs really taught me. They taught me to be present, they taught me to be peaceful, and they taught me to be fierce, to fiercely protect those moments where I can be present and peaceful because you can't be perfect in being present and peaceful, but you have to be fierce in protecting those moments and you have to be fierce in protecting that kind of lifestyle. And that's what prairie dogs mean to me. Uh, they're present, peaceful, and fierce at the same time. I would not have come to this kind of clarity and peace in my life without the prairie dogs. I'm positive I would not have come to this without them. So I will always be grateful for them. They will always be my favorite creature um, on this earth. So thank you guys for, for being here. Okay, thank you very much, Mariana. And if we could ask you to turn back on your video. Um, yes. I do have quite a number of questions. 
Oh boy. Um, that was a great talk. Thank you so much. Um, I feel like I learned a lot. Okay. Um, I have quite a few comments in here saying to tell you that this was a great talk and thank you so much for the presentation. Oh, thank you guys. So I have a lot of questions. <laughs> um, so let's start. Um, okay, let's look at my list of questions here. Um, all right, so the first question is, is more about you. How did you fall into mammal research? Um, I actually learned about mammals during my schooling uh, when I got my bachelor's in wildlife biology in Maine. My mentor was an ornithologist, but he ran a mammalogy lab and he asked me to help teach it. And that forced me to learn a lot about mammals. And I, I mean, my mammalogy book is sitting five feet from me right now. I keep it with me at all times. And I really fell in love with mammals. Um, uh, they get a lot of attention as furry, cute creatures, and uh, so a lot of my peers were like, ah, mammals are easy, but um, especially rodents, you know, not everybody loves rodents, so um, I, I fell in love with them that way. Cool, thank you. I don't know if you have a light in your room, but um, that might help if you turn on. How's that? There, that's a little better. Okay, thanks. Now there's a whole sort of series of questions about prairie dog populations. Sure. Um, so I'll just go into that for a little while. Um, okay, so some people are wondering if the um, if if the populations are increasing or decreasing in the Valles Caldera. If there are different, like you know, if there are you already talked about one colony that collapsed, but if there are certain other geographic areas that have increasing or decreasing populations, if they're moving into different areas or moving out, et cetera. Yeah, so I, I heard from a park ranger that year that as he was scouting around, he saw a lot of empty colonies as well. So there was a pretty big plague event that year and prairie dog populations will rise and fall um, because of plague as well. Um, in, the, in the Valles Caldera, they're actually um, thinking about possibly moving some dogs and reintroducing them to areas where they once were historically. Um, there were areas a little farther um, down in elevation where there used to be prairie dogs, but are no longer. Um, but right now in the VCMP, there's a very healthy population and the, and the Gunnison's prairie dogs are doing really well, gladly. Okay, great. Um, and then um, we were wondering if when the babies are born, if it's the same number of males and females that are born or if it's a slightly skew distribution? That's a good question. Mostly in mammals, it's 50-50. And that tends to be the average with prairie dogs as well. Um, it's 50-50. So the more females, the better, because that means um, that they can reproduce more quickly. But yeah, it tends to be 50-50, just as is true for most mammals. Okay, great. And is survival about the same um, for males and females? Males have much shorter lifespans. So, you know, we, we talked about a five-year-old female being geriatric and on average, males don't live that long. Uh, maybe four years old would be a geriatric male. They have a much harder life and uh, they tend to be bolder and bolder animals don't, don't live as long. Okay, thank you. Um, now, I, uh, let's see, uh, another question about the populations or the territories. How large is the territory of a dominant male? Oh, that's a good question. Um, it's probably about, it can be about a quarter of an acre um, or yeah, probably about a quarter of an acre. It usually doesn't get much larger than that. Um, if it's a very strong male, he might have an even larger area, but they don't want their territories to be too large because then they can't keep track of their boundaries. Okay, so kind of the size of sort of like an average backyard kind of. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. So your backyard size would be the territory of a male. Okay, um, on another, a couple of questions about their predators. Um, someone wanted to know if there were burrowing owls uh, seen amongst those. Yeah, so unfortunately we do not have burrowing owls in the VCMP, but that's a good question because prairie dogs do provide habitat for burrowing owls. The owls will use their burrows. Um, I wish we had them up here, but we don't. Okay, and what about um, you mentioned badgers, and do you know, like, what, what is the population of badgers like in the Mayas Caldera? I don't know. That's a good question. Um, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I do know that there have been, there were two distinct badgers in 2018 at the visitor center at our site. One of them was a mother with three babies. That is the most I can tell you. Sorry, I don't know about their population. Um, 
Okay. Let's see. So then we had people curious about how they escape predators that go into their tunnels. Like you mentioned weasels, and I don't know if a badger can fit into a prairie dog tunnel, but how, how do they escape once they're underground? Um, so badgers will go in at night um, and dig more space for themselves um, while the prairie dogs are sleeping. Um, but most, mostly during the day, they won't um, go into the tunnels because they don't fit. Uh, the weasels, they fit really well. So prairie dog burrows all have exit holes and they usually have multiple exit holes. They have one main entrance that they use most commonly when they wake up and go to bed, but they also have a bunch of exit tunnels. So they have many choices when, when a predator enters. Um, and usually unless they get confused or they're taken by surprise, they can escape pretty easily. Okay, great. Um, let's see. And then are there any techniques that can help us see that underground geometry? That's a good question. Um, I know that there are technologies that archaeologists use um, to see underground, but it's cost prohibitive. So wildlife is a poor man's science. Um, we don't have a lot of funding. And so we haven't been able to do something like that um, extensively for burrows. There are cameras that will go under there and John actually had a couple of experiments where he tried cameras. One was shaped like a snake, but the the tunnels, the prairie dog tunnels, are, they take sudden turns. They're very tight sometimes, so it's very difficult to control a camera going into the uh, going into a tunnel. I'm sure somebody could do it if they really dedicated some engineering thought into it. Um, but as far as our team, we weren't able to really um, get a good image down there. Um, okay. Um, great, let's see. Um, okay, now there were a couple of questions about the uh, prairie dog language. Um, and so someone was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit more about their language. You showed us the bark and you showed us the territorial call. Um, is there anything else you can tell us about their language? Yes. So this is a difficult question for me because there has been a lot of research about um, differences in, in, in alarm calls according to um, what predator was approaching, for example. Um, there's one famous researcher, his name is Khan Sobachnikov. Um, he did um, one of the most famous papers on um, the difference in voice and um, the, the sonic differences in an alarm call, depending on what was approaching the prairie dog, um, whether he, he used um, people wearing different t-shirt, colored t-shirts, things like that. Um, that's a very famous paper. Um, but to be frank, the methodology is flawed and the dogs weren't marked. Uh, you, I, I strongly believe you can't do that kind of research without marked dogs. Um, but that's not to, not to say that Slobachnikov is um, sloppy or anything. It just happened that that, that paper's methodology is a little flawed. Um, so, but that's kind of the going, a running narrative. And John actually took uh, several years of data to test that theory he did not find that alarm calls were different for terrestrial predators. Um, that, those are the results of his data uh, using marked dogs. Uh, but it, there is a different call that they use for raptors. They usually just let out one bark. I think I mentioned it earlier and, and then they go down. Up here, the gunnisons, um, John doesn't know if other species do this. Um, actually, he doesn't know if the white tails, I should say, do this. But the gunnisons, they will um, thump their back legs if they see a snake. They don't let out an alarm call when a snake is near, but they will approach the snake and thump their back legs at the snake. And we're pretty sure it's to agitate the snake because uh, the dog is trying to herd the snake away from the burrow that the snake is approaching. So that's an interesting response we only see between Gunnison's prairie dogs and snakes. So kind of a complicated question. Sorry for the complicated answer. No, that's okay. Um, so when you showed us the bark, the alarm call, um, that was probably a, it, it was like a terrestrial animal, maybe even you. Yeah, so that, that one I believe was a coyote at that time. So, but they do also bark at humans in the same way. And um, the only other vocalization that I didn't show you, there's actually another vocalization that they will make when they're being abused. So sometimes an adult male will force a younger male into his burrow 
and actually bury him. So he'll kick dirt into the burrow entrance until it's fully plugged. This is um, a type of abusive behavior um, that we don't fully understand. Of course, it's a dominance behavior, but while that's happening, the, the smaller prairie dog will let out these little cries of protest. Um, and it's a very distinct sound. So if you hear it, you know what's happening, even if you can't see it. And the only other vocalization is a small little chirp that mothers will give their babies when they want the babies to follow them. And I don't have a recording of that. So it, it'd be, I don't know, it would be impossible with my equipment to capture a recording of that. Um, but that's the only other vocalization um, that I've heard out there. Okay, and um, you mentioned that uh, John had done some analysis of the, uh, the sounds, the alarm calls that they made. Is there any like kind of specialized equipment you use or you just analyze it like by year or? Yeah, he uses a sort of almost ultrasound sort of sonic um, uh, device. Um, I'm not completely sure how it works, um, but the, it images the sound. And so you can see differences in pitch or differences in voice um, that way. Okay, cool. Um, let's see, now I have a couple of questions about the methodology of the research. Um, so let's see. Um, let's see. Okay, so um, people were wondering if the ear tags, um, do they stay on for the whole lives of the fairy dogs? Um, they do not. So they are meant to, and for most females, actually, they stay on. For most males, we will, we will capture them again and find that one is missing, usually. And so we have to put a new ear tag in, um, sometimes in fights. Um, or when they're running around, the ear tag might come out, might be torn out. The idea is, is for them to stay their whole life, and sometimes they do, but they very often fall out. Okay, and can you only read the ear tags when you capture the animal? Yeah, so they're tiny, teeny etched uh, numbers. Sometimes it's an alphanumeric um, and on the ear tag, and I, I can't even read them with a binocular. You have to be, you have to have the dog in hand to be able to read them. Okay. And then can you tell us again how they mark the babies when they're born? Yeah, so the babies we mark the same as the adults with the dye. Um, a baby will be given the same marking, the same number or marking scheme as their mother, but we use the same kind of hair dye and we don't differentiate babies. So a mother, if her number is 50, all of her babies will be numbered 50. Um, and if she has a daughter, she also gets a cap, a black cap on her head to tell the difference between her daughters and sons. Okay, great. Um, some people were wondering how the studies are funded. So John uh, Hoagland, my mentor, he works out of the University of Maryland. He is a research professor and that's where he got his funding. He also had an NSF grant for his research assistants. Um, funding is very difficult for wildlife research. Um, but his research is very well funded because he's a huge name in prairie dog um, ecology and I was really lucky to work with him. It was, it was a pretty well funded um, research project as far as wildlife goes. Okay, um, and then a, a question just came in on the uh, tagging, if, if it would be possible to use microchips for permanent IDs or? Um, that's a good question. So microchips are a possibility uh, they are cost prohibitive and they're also more uh, invasive than uh, an ear tag, for example. They, are, they do make it more certain that you can identify the prairie dog because you won't typically lose the microchip un unless it's, it's migrated for some reason. Um, but they require a syringe and they require um, inserting the microchip. It's a big syringe and you don't have to put the prairie dog to sleep to do it. Um, but it is pretty painful and more invasive. And as I mentioned before, very cost prohibitive. Okay. Um, and then there were a couple of questions about the plague. They're wondering, um, is it the Yersinia pestis? Is it like a bubonic plague or pneumonic plague? It is, it's the Yersinia pestis bacterium. And it does create the bubonic plague and the pneumonic plague. And in wildlife, it's the same disease. It, we just call it the sylvatic plague, but it's the same bacterium. Okay, and so how do you, oh, sorry. Sorry, so it's the same plague that wiped out a, a huge human population in the Middle Ages. Yeah, so the, the big question is, how do you as researchers protect yourselves from fleas and plague when you're in the field? 
Yeah, so um, we got a lot of fleas on us. Um, I don't know how we didn't contract plague, um, but we make sure that we're aware of the symptoms. If you do contract plague, you have to be able to identify the systems very the symptoms very quickly and take yourself to a hospital. And while you're there, you you inform um, the responders that you work with prairie dogs, and they can very quickly put two and two together. Um, but it's very difficult to protect yourself from fleas when you're handling prairie dogs. We would remove as many fleas as possible, but of course, um, it, we took one or two home. Uh, we would shower every evening, make sure that they weren't sticking around. But um, sometimes it's a matter of luck not getting an infected flea on you. Okay, um, there's a question um, that was emailed in about um, how prairie dogs behave in an urban setting versus um, in a wild setting. Um, and so I know that there are some, in some cases there can be like conflicts between prairie dog con colonies and human um, communities. And what, what thoughts do you have about this? Yeah, so it's difficult because um, the conflicts are often difficult to resolve. Um, the typical answer is to either eradicate the prairie dogs or to relocate them. Um, obviously, it, it, you would prefer to relocate them. I would prefer to relocate them. Relocation is very difficult. Um, it's best if you can watch the colony for a while so that you, you know who's related to who and you know certain behaviors. That would make the relocation more successful. But these are usually, usually done in a hurry if, um, if there's been a real conflict and you know a county council um, or some you know decision maker has decided to get rid of the colony or if, if buildings have to go up really quickly and they usually do it in a hurry and those re relocation efforts often fail and the prairie dogs eventually die anyway um, but it's very important to take um, their needs into consideration um, often they are viewed as a pest simply because it's a, a cultural um, a cultural opinion that gets passed down and it's, it's easy to just view them as pests, but they are actually very good for the grassland. I know that they can sometimes give ranchers um, trouble. Uh, statistically speaking, they don't really cause much damage in that account, but of course, um, I always try to think of, you know, uh, human needs as well. So, you know, I, I'm, I would never tell a rancher, hey, prairie dogs are more important than your cows. Um, no matter how I feel, because that's somebody's livelihood. And I would never tell somebody prairie dogs are more important than your garden, because that's a source of happiness for somebody. But I would encourage um, a way to reconcile human needs with prairie dog needs, because prairie dogs don't have to be a pest if they can be managed well, and they don't have to be removed if they can be managed well. Um, there's no easy answer. Most of the time, they're just removed to avoid conflict, because it's difficult um, to find a happy middle between people and prairie dogs. Okay, thank you. Um, and then finally, um, can you provide any recommended readings about prairie dogs? And is there anything um, in particular about our local area or the Bias Caldera? Um, yeah, so I would definitely recommend um, anything written by John. So we actually have this website actually here at the bottom. Uh, prairiedoghoagland.com. That's a website that John and I put together and every one of his peer-reviewed papers is on that website and they are open source. He has also written a book about the black-tailed prairie dog. He's currently working on his book about the Gunnison's prairie dog. Um, so when that comes out, or actually about all the prairie dog species he's he has studied. So um, when that comes out, I definitely recommend reading it. I'm looking forward to it. Um, but there are also other books about Utah prairie dogs. Um, there's one I have on my shelf. I'm sorry, I don't remember the author. Um, I can't think of any others. I mostly just read John's work. I should probably read other books. Okay, awesome. I'm putting that. Uh, I'm putting that link in the in the uh, chat in case anyone wants to go check it out. Let me try that. Great. Again. You think that is an actual link. There you go. Um, so if anyone wants to check that out for more information about prairie dogs. Okay, Mariana, that was really fascinating. And I just want to thank you for myself and for all our watchers today. Um, we really appreciated your talk and your um, also your philosophy. It was really um, nice to hear. Um, so those are our questions uh, for tonight. Um, Thank you all for joining us uh, for this talk about prairie dogs. Thank um, you.
if you look on our website, peaknature.org, um, you will see that we have published a blog post about um, Mariana or as an interview with Mariana this week. So go check that out if you want to hear a little bit more about her thoughts on um, nature and naturalists. Um, you can find that and a lot of our other events at peaknature.org. Um, so check it out. Uh, we'll be having some more events like this one. So if you like this one, um, tune in for others. You can check our website once again, peaknature.org. And everyone have a wonderful night. Good night. Good night. Thank you very much for joining us.